you know them as trainers in the UK, runners in Ireland, or sneakers in the United States, one thing's clear, these aren't just shoes, they're cultural icons. Over the years, sneakers have woven their way into pop culture, music, and even your social media feed. They've become high-value commodities, not just in terms of retail price, but also as intellectual property. But how did it get to this point? Well, that's what we're here to find out today. These are the hidden stories behind sneaker history. The first sneakers made their debut in 1876, crafted by the new Liverpool Rubber Company in England. These pioneering rubber-soled wonders were quaintly called beach shoes, or plim soles, a maritime term referring to the line where a ship's hull meets the water. And while we're on the topic of names, let's clear up a little myth about the word sneakers itself. Since the word appeared in a 1917 Keds advertisement, a lot of people think that the marketer Henry McKinney was the one who coined it. But in 2010, researcher Andrew Newman debunked this. He found an 1887 article suggesting that the term sneakers described how children could silently sneak up on their teachers thanks to those soft rubber soles. The more you know, huh? <laughs> Anyway, from the 1890s to the 1930s, sneaker designs saw some notable developments. Reebok, then known as J.W. Foster and Sons, broke new ground with leather running shoes that had metal spikes for better grip. Meanwhile, in Germany, a man named Adolf Addy Dassler, along with his older brother Rudolf, started crafting leather running and football shoes in the 1920s. While both were leather, their football shoes had studs instead of spikes, offering players an advantage on the grassy field. Then came Chuck Taylor. Before him, basketball didn't have its iconic shoes. But being a semi-pro player turned converse salesman, Taylor took his passion for the game to a commercial level. He was so effective in promoting converse that he became the brand's poster boy. This led to the creation of the Chuck Taylor All-Star the first celebrity-endorsed athletic shoe, and the go-to choice for basketball players from the early 1900s through to the 60s and 70s. But the influence of the Chuck Taylor didn't stop at the basketball court. It made its way into music scenes, skate parks, and became a staple for everyday wear. But more on that later. Fast forward to World War II, and sneaker production hit a major obstacle. Many companies had to stop their operations and contribute to the war effort. Converse, however, found itself on the favorable side of the U.S. Army contracts. Across the Atlantic, the Dassler brothers faced a different reality. Their shoe factory was co-opted to manufacture anti-tank weapons in 1944. Yet, thanks to the legacy of their footwear and its association with athletic triumphs, U.S. servicemen stationed in Germany after the war were eager to slip into Dassler sneakers. This enthusiasm breathed new life into the company, paving the way for the sneaker culture we know today. The Dasslers also understood the value of IP, perhaps more so than any other sneaker designer back then. After their partnership dissolved due to unresolved tensions, the brothers became business rivals in their own hometown of Herzogenrath in Germany. Rudolf was the first off the mark, founding Ruda in January 1948, which he later rebranded to Puma, registering the name with the German Patent and Trademark Office. Not to be outdone, Addy launched his own venture, Adidas, a few months later in August 1949. In 1952, Addy acquired the iconic Three Stripes logo from the Finnish sportswear company Karu Sports for what is now seen as a modest sum the moderate equivalent of 1,600 euro, and rumor has it, two bottles of whiskey. Those three stripes have since become emblematic of Adidas and represent a trademark of immeasurable value. While Puma's Leaping Cat logo has enjoyed its own measure of success, it hasn't achieved the level of universal recognition that Adidas three stripes have. Fast forward a bit and we arrive at the 1960s a decade that witnessed the birth of other major players in the sneaker world, Nike and Vans. But they didn't experience instant stardom. Nike, originally named Blue Ribbon Sports, was a relative unknown until it rebranded in 1971, unveiling the swoosh that would become its calling card. 
Yet it wasn't until 1974 that the company secured trademark protection for its iconic design. On the other hand, vans only truly took off in the mid 70s as skateboarders and BMX bikers adopted the sneakers for the sticky traction of their soles. The brand's off the wall slogan and logo, both introduced during this period, encapsulate its counterculture ethos so perfectly that they're still the emblems of skater and BMX subcultures today. Meanwhile, over at Nike, founders Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman were busy revolutionizing athletic footwear with air cushion soles, an innovation that today feels as standard as laces. The 70s also gave us some of the earliest athletic endorsements that turned heads and open wallets. Football's great Pele rocked Puma, while tennis ace Stan Smith made Adidas even cooler. But hold on, because the 1980s would dial the endorsement game up to 11. Athletes across various sports became walking billboards for sneaker brands, transforming logos into cultural icons. Speaking of icons, let's talk about Walt Clyde Fraser and his Puma Clyde. Much like the Chuck Taylor Fraser's unique sense of style translated into a sneaker that bore not just his name, but his actual signature. Made of suede and available in a array of colors, the Clyde might not be as famous as other basketball shoes, but it's a classic that found a second life in dance circles in the 1980s and continues to make waves today. And then there's Michael Jordan, the man who could have changed the course of sneaker history with a single decision. Although he initially wanted to sign with Adidas, Destiny had a different path in mind. The 1985 debut of the Nike Air Jordan rewrote the playbook. These kicks weren't just for basketball, they were for life. The appeal of Air Jordans transcended the court, making them must-haves for anyone who aspired to be like Mike. Today, they're not just sneakers, they're a pop culture legend as coveted as any modern fashion item could be. But let's not forget Adidas. In the 80s, they were already a powerhouse in soccer and had a deal with NBA star Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. However, their most surprising coup was in music. Hip-hop legends Run DMC inked the first ever music artist shoe endorsement with their 1986 hit, My Adidas. Breaking down barriers between sports and music. Around the same time, Vans and Converse found their champions in the punk, metal, and grunge scenes. Ironically, as Converse's basketball star was fading due to competition from Nike and Adidas, the brand was adopted by subcultures that generally resisted mainstream commercialism. It was a perfect case of turning a bug into a feature, allowing Converse to seep deep into cultural veins. But back to Nike. Even with the Air Jordan juggernaut, the brand didn't solidify its industry supremacy until the unveiling of its Just Do It slogan in 1988. This fusion of product and intellectual property has catalyzed a booming resale market, currently estimated at around 6 billion USD. Music too has played a vital role in elevating sneakers from their athletic footwear to cultural icons. Rap, reggaeton, and hip hop have become accelerators, embedding sneakers into the fabric of modern fashion. From the Puma suede's supported by the 80s B-Boys and B-Girls to the Nike Air Force Ones that became a staple among rappers, the symbiosis between music and sneaker culture is undeniable. Rock and punk weren't far behind, with icons like Kurt Cobain, Joe Strummer, and Billy Joe Armstrong rocking Converse kicks. And while the guy may be super controversial today, the impact Kanye West has had on the sneaker culture with his Yeezys cannot be ignored. But as sneakers' cultural influence grew, so did their price tags. What was once relegated to the gym or the skate park has vaulted onto runways and into the annals of high fashion. It's an evolution that mirrors broader cultural shifts. The initial affordability and accessibility of brands like Nike, Adidas, and Converse created a foundation in everyday street style. But as these shoes were adopted and elevated by influencers from the music world and beyond, the boundaries between street and luxury began to dissolve. With single pairs of shoes selling for as high as $20,000 and sometimes even more than that. And that's where we are today. The reselling business in sneakers brings both opportunity and dismissiveness. Something that has started in the early 2000s is still topical as we speak. 
I hope you learned a lot today and want to thank you for being part of our road to 10,000 subs. Make sure you brush off your shoulders and I'll see you back next time.